Uh, a very good evening to everyone here today. First of all, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for being here. I hope you and your dear ones are keeping well and safe in these current times. I'm Shivani Rao. I'm a research coordinator at GCTC, and I welcome you all on behalf of the GCTC team to the month in series 2021. I would like to thank our patrons, the executive council, and the advisory board for their support and guidance. For those of you who do not know much about GCTC, a Global Counterterrorism Council is a global think tank that was established in 2016. We provide a platform for brainstorming and thought-provoking discussions and events on issues ranging from national security, defense, and international relations. Over the years, GCTC has grown as a family with over 450 distinguished luminaries from across the globe. It also, we also have six international chapters working on the core issues of national and international security. At GCTC, we are striving to create valuable contributions during COVID, and GCTC Manthan is one of our initiatives for the same. GCTC Manthan was initiated last year during the lockdown to connect people across borders. It is a series of webinars that aims to encourage informational discussions on current national and international events. More than 100 webinars have successfully been organized as a part of it. Today, we are here to commence the second day of the GCTC Manthan 2021 series. Two sessions are scheduled for today on the uh, topics related to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, before formally introducing the speakers, I would like to give a brief overview about today's topic. I would also like to request all our audiences to maintain the decorum of the event and keep their cameras and mics turned off. The topic does not need a lot of detailed explanation, as it is noted to be one of the throbbing issues in the current international scenario. The most recent conflict, which began in April 2021, has climbed the life of several Palestinians and Israelites, including children and women. The creation of the State of Israel in 1948, after the end of the British Mandate, marks the beginning of the disputes between the Jews and the Palestinian Arabs over homeland rights. Later on, the world witnessed a series of bloody riots, conflicts, and inter- and intra-wars. At present, Hamas, the largest Palestinian militant group, and the Israeli Defense Forces are fighting each other on claim over disputed territories. As of now, there are three prone disputed territories in the region, the Gaza Strip, West Banks, and Eastern Jerusalem. The attempts by the IDF to evict Palestinians from their homes in Eastern Jerusalem trigger the current conflict. Um, fighting erupted when the Israeli police forcefully entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem on April 13, the first night of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, and disconnected speakers broadcasting prayers as Ruben Rivlin, the Israeli president, was speaking at the Western Wall, a site sacred to the Jewish people. On May 7th, Israeli police raided the mosque. The raid at the holy Muslim site on one of the holiest nights of Ramadan is viewed by Arabs as a violation of their religious rights. Later on, at Sheikh Jarrah, the Israeli settlers and members of the Palestinian far-right political party, Ozma Yehudi, clashed with each other on 6 May 2021, followed by the deployment of Israeli police at the Temple Mount during the final Friday prayer of Ramadan. This escalated to a clash between the Palestinians and the Israel troops. On the 10th of May, Hamas fired rockets into Israel from Gaza, which was followed by a counter airstrike by the IDF. As of 20th May 2021, the Palestinian National Authority reported 232 deaths and at least 1,900 injured Palestinians, while as of 12th May 2021, Israel National Authority uh, Israel reported 12 deaths and at least 200 injured Israelis. After several tensions and much bloodshed on 21st May, both Hamas and Israel enacted a ceasefire, which ended the 11 days of fighting. Despite the ceasefire, tension still prevails in the region as well as across the globe over the conflict. The conflict between these two, these two regions is not confined to these territories but has a much wider reach both regionally and globally. For example, the South Asian countries have their own historical and cultural interest in the region. Countries like India, Nepal and Sri Lanka have long-term diplomatic ties with Israel and in 2020, Bhutan normalized its relationship with them. Meanwhile, the South Asian Muslim majority states like Pakistan and Bangladesh are champions of the Palestinian cause. When the recent tension erupted in Gaza, it had its impact in the South Asian region as well. Keeping this in mind, today's first session will focus on the South Asian perspective of the conflict, in which the major objectives are understanding the history of South Asian countries stand in the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, to assess the factors driving South Asian countries' perception of the conflict, along with assessing the challenges confronting India and other South Asian countries' approach towards Israel and Palestine, and also to critically assess the implications for these countries' larger strategy in West Asia. With this, I would like to formally introduce and welcome our distinguished panel for today's session on the Israel-Palestine conflict perspectives from South Asia. Uh, joining us today uh, is Ms. Nirupama Subramanian, resident editor of the Indian Express Mumbai and national affairs editor North. I formally welcome ma'am, the moderator of our session. 
I will, I would also like to welcome Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs, former Indian Ambassador to Thailand, and Distinguished Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Next, I would like to welcome Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, former India's Ambassador to Libya, Jordan, and High Commissioner to Malta. At present, he is the President of the Millennial Chamber of Commerce, Industry, and Agriculture. Continuing, I welcome Dr. Vahi Lover, a Senior International Independent Journalist and Political Analyst. He is currently the president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia. Now I welcome uh, Lieutenant General Naeem Khalid Lodi, former Honor Def Honorable Defense Minister and Defense Secretary of Pakistan. Sir, we are honored to welcome you to the event. I would also like to welcome Dr. Bansidhar Pradhan, professor at the Center for West Asian Studies, School of International Studies at the Jawaharlal, ne ne Jawaharlal Nehru University. His area of specialization include the politics and foreign policy of West Asia, with a focus on the fertile crescent countries, terrorism, Israel-Palestine conflict, and India-West Asia relations. <clears throat> Moving on, I welcome Dr. Nanda Kishore, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He is a senior fellow at a veteran think tank, Defense Research and Studies in India, and analyst at the Islamic Theology Center of Count Theology of Counterterrorism, London. So I formally welcome you to the webinar. I would also like to welcome Haji Sayyid Salman Chishti, Chairman of the Chishti Foundation, and Lieutenant General Shokin Chahan, former Director General of Assam Rifles and Executive Council Member of the Global Counter-Terrorism Council. Uh, I also welcome Major General Muhammad Ali Sikdar. Major, Sik Major Sikdar regularly writes articles in mainstream dailies in Bangladesh, covering areas of geopolitics, security, terrorism as a, terrorism as a political security analyst. Uh, he has 18 books published so far, including a book titled Middle East Crisis and United States of America. Finally, I would like to welcome Major General Kitsiri Ekanyake, a retired Major General of Sri Lanka Army and Vice Chairman of the Sri Lanka Army Small Arms Association. Um, with this, I would like to pass the baton to Ms. Nirupama Subramanian, the moderator of our session, and I hope everyone has an enriching experience today. Thank you very much, Shivani. Uh, Thank you, Aditya, and all friends at uh, GCTC, and all distinguished guests, distinguished speakers and guests. And thank you for uh, thank you to GCTC for organizing this session on a very important, uh, literally burning topic. Uh, while the whole world has been consumed by um, just surviving the pandemic, um, some festering problems in the world uh, seem to have got new twists. To the plot and uh, Israel-Palestine issues one of those. Now, of course, there's a ceasefire, as Shivani pointed out, but one does not know how long that will last or whether it can prevent another conflagration. Unless, of course, the issues are resolved and addressed. But as Shivani nicely summed it up, there are there are uh, such deep issues that they have. Uh, evaded resolution, all diplomatic resolution for so many years. Uh, it's the longest running conflict in the world and it has divided the world in many ways uh, since 1948 uh, between uh, those who stand with Israel, those who stand with Palestine and those who seem to occupy a middle ground. Most of South Asia with its own colonial past and India and Pakistan in particular, have a long legacy of support for the Palestinian cause. In uh, India's case, the UN partition plan of um, 1948 towards creating uh, Israel, uh, a religious state, uh, hark back to the time of its own partition, which was, of course, still very uh, uh, fresh in everybody's minds. Uh, it, there was the dispossession of the Palestinians was another theme that resonated both uh, in India and Pakistan in, po in post-colonial uh, South Asia. It was also one of the rare causes, if I may say, on which India and Pakistan were on, found themselves on the same side. There was a PLO office in New Delhi starting uh, with the uh, from the 1980s, and all this was not just idealism. There was a realist side, a very strong realist element to all this. Uh, for India, of course, it was one way of pre preempting uh, Pakistan's attempts to isolate India uh, in the Islamic world over the issue of Kashmir. 
uh, India also had a, uh, the the largest uh, its largest minority um, was uh, the Muslims of the Muslim citizens of this country, and as India's energy needs grew. its dependence on arab countries for oil imports was another factor but all this changed in 19 uh, 1991 that was a huge turning point for the whole world and uh, and its repercussions the gulf war the break up of the soviet union all this had its repercussions on um, on all kinds of alignments there were realignments uh, after uh, after the cold war after the gulf war and india's establishment of diplomatic uh, full diplomatic relations with israel was a uh, was a turning point also in its relations with palestine and in recent years we have seen those relations with india with israel uh, grow and the balancing uh, act with uh, palestine consequently in pakistan the question has cropped up again and again about uh, whether there are moves to establish uh, relations with israel which is which is more unthinkable for pakistan than it than it was for india and uh, and people are asking why not if uae has done this uh, an ally of pakistan then uh, why shouldn't uh, why shouldn't pakistan do it and uh, saudi arabia a us ally has not exactly opposed the abraham accords mm-hmm. but uh, so between uh, so this is this is one question that has come up in south asia and then we have sri lanka between israel and sri lanka there are strong military to military ties israel supplied military hardware throughout the civil war uh, to uh, sri lanka uh, it's uh, i particularly recall that the that the bomb jets were uh, that were used in northern sri lanka the the kefir uh, planes were from were from israel um and there has been speculation in the last 2 or 3 months that bangladesh which is which is strongly uh, been against um, uh, i mean at least openly publicly it has taken a very anti israel uh, stand even during this most recent uh, conflagration might be moving towards normalizing relation, uh, uh, relations with uh, israel we today we have a raft of very very experienced uh, knowledgeable distinguished speakers uh, who are going to give us um, insights into all this i'm looking forward to this uh, whole session because it's going to be such a such a lot of learning for me personally Uh, so i will um, stop speaking now mm, i have some some questions which i will uh, pose later on then there will be a discussion thereafter there there's a lot of audience i can see there uh, almost 56 people who have joined now excluding the speakers and uh, that's a great audience to have so i will um, start with um, ambassador pinaki ranjan chakravarti um, sir if you will if you make your presentation so thank you very much for uh, this platform and uh, i speak both from uh, a knowledge of uh, of the region where i spent uh, three postings i speak arabic and i learned a bit of hebrew when i was in israel and uh, so and i was the second uh, group of uh, diplomats who uh after the embassy was opened in tel aviv uh, in 1992 but that's another story but let me get down to the conflict at first we now have a ceasefire and a lot of questions that have arisen ki why have 11 days of uh, this kind of uh, violence sort of uh, give and take why, why didn't it sort of stop uh, earlier it could have these rounds have taken place earlier too of course egypt has been active behind the scenes and so has president biden in terms of uh, uh but there are it's a, it's far more complex than egypt and uh, and president biden it's also about uh, the netanyahu who uh, has been prime minister ever since uh, you know when i was in israel from 95 to 99 i think by 96 he had become prime minister and i had met him many times and uh, and i always must i must say i came away very impressed with his with his political acumen and all kinds of his uh, his glib talk and uh, 
but he has uh, dominated israel's politics for a long time unfortunately the left in israel or the center left has withered away and uh, the the left that was represented or the center left by itchak ravin who pioneered the sort of oslo accords with uh, yasser arafat and uh, who i remember very well because in israel i was i was nominated to be the 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 conduit uh, with uh, yasser arafat and i met him many times in gaza in fact i was sent to gaza to open the office uh, uh, with the plo and i do remember when i first asked yasser arafat that there is some debate uh, whether to whether to open the office in gaza or in ramallah which was the other main uh, city uh, so uh, he looked at me smiled and said uh the office should be where i am based so which means that please do please open it in gaza so anyway those are anecdotal uh, things coming back to the problem so i think there is one aspect about domestic politics in all this i'm not going getting into the details of how many rockets were fired all of you know all that that the one month given to uh, given to lapid yaar lapid who was asked to form the government now 11 days out of that one month is gone uh, now uh, and the arabs uh, the arab parties who were supposed to support uh, yair lapid and i think uh, will no longer uh, i think yair lapid himself will probably back away now so i think uh, it might give uh, a, a a rope um, a short one perhaps to netanyahu uh, to maybe make a comeback again and you know um, having been prime minister for 12 continuous years i wonder if he's uh, if he's using this also as a uh, as a as a sort of uh, as a stepping stone towards another prime ministership though i must add here a caveat that uh, he's not the one who started it i think it all started as you know um, i think there were combination of several factors there was uh, ramzan going on and there was the uh, jerusalem day being celebrated and the of course the right wing and others um, were you know usually provoke uh, the the uh, the arabs in uh, east jerusalem and it started off you know at damascus gate after the breaking of the fast the arab uh, the young arab boys and girls uh, not so many girls but i would say boys would gather around uh, damascus gate you know chat etc and these right wing uh, israelis uh, went there on jerusalem day and made a lot of provocative kind of things then of course the the issue of the al aqsa mosque and uh, the israelis went in there etc this has happened before and um, and i i don't see anything uh, anything abnormal in the sense that uh, this is a kind of a repeat it's a sense of deja vu that uh, one has seen i visited all these places so i have a very good idea of the topography and how it all happened now uh, uh, i i don't know whether i uh, sorry i keep going back into some of the anecdotal things that uh, but i thought you might be interested uh, there is a there is a indian hospice a very old one inside the old city of jerusalem which houses the anra head, headquarters and, and it's a kind of a guest house that we helped uh, them sort of uh, build for people to come and stay now uh, now this uh, this place is not far from where the damascus gate is now what happened was that uh, the the netanyahu government actually uh, told the, these right wing jerusalem day marchers that you please change this route because they they did expect uh, some uh, trouble which they did and of course there was celebration by the young arab uh, boys Uh, on the streets which again was a kind of a, a sort of a um, uh, green signal for these guys to come back again so anyway this all broke out and we had but it was probably the first time that hamas has um, you know fired rockets at jerusalem i don't know whether they have done this before and so this again created another provocation you could say from their side and uh, so the israelis retaliated as as they would always do and uh, so i think what has happened today is that or oh, yesterday 
Friday that we've had a ceasefire. So now who gains, who wins, etc., uh, is something that we will all assess. I'm sure. I've already mentioned about uh, Netanyahu's domestic situation, and I believe the Hamas is also going to gain. In terms of popularity, uh, uh, Palestinian authority based in Ramallah. See, the problem now is that the, that, uh, the Palestinians are divided and uh, the, between Hamas and, uh, and the Palestinian authority in Ramallah. So there is no cohesiveness in terms of their resistance and their fight against Israel. But I should add that it's a hopeless fight. I mean, uh, in the sense that the, the, the Arab world is divided, and if you notice the Arab reaction, is, it's been generally muted, apart from, of course, uh, the non-Arab countries like uh, Turkey and Iran, and, of course, Pakistan. Where, uh, but I'll come to the South Asian situation a bit later. Um, uh, whoever is uh, in control, please do ring a bell so that I can stop on time, uh, because otherwise I'll keep talking. <laughs> so... so uh, <laughs> Each has seven minutes. Right. And, uh, so please just keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I think uh, what we are looking at here again is that uh, uh, that it's a very old issue and probably the longest, uh, one of the longest disputes in the world has ever seen. And it is unlikely to end uh, in a two state solution, in my view, uh, because the 1948 two state solution. Everybody supports, India supports, and Indian statement also uh, supported that. It was part of the Indian statement. Now, India's, India's relationship with, uh, with the Palestinians and uh, Israelis have changed over the years. The very fact that we, op we, op we opened the embassy uh, was the beginning in 1992, uh, uh, when PM Narasimha was there, actually, as prime minister. And I do remember being part of that effort. Now, what has happened over the years is that uh, the BJP and others who have been known to be closer to, to, the, to, the, uh, to, to Israel in many ways have really now brought the relationship out of the closet in many ways. And so now you have a relationship where it's more balanced. You could say earlier we were, we were leaning more towards uh, the Palestinians. Today you could, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's arguable. Uh, whether it is more balanced or it is more pro-Israel, name it what the way. The fact is that our uh, our uh, strategic relationship with Israel is very strong now, and it's unlikely that it will get uh, diluted. Uh, uh, and under Netanyahu, it has really deepened the law. So I think we have our own interests, but we will. We, uh, India is obviously has good relations with all these countries now, including the Palestinians. And the and the and the and the Gulf Arabs, and I think the breakthrough in the relationship with the Gulf Arabs is certainly a, a huge, huge milestone for Israel. Now, coming to South Asia, I think uh, we have we are also seeing here a, a, a fairly muted kind of a reaction that, uh, that, but somehow there is fatigue in this whole business of uh, you know this India the Israel Palestine issue. Of course, in Pakistan, there have been a lot of uh, agitation, including by some of the really the right wingers saying that Pakistan uh, has nuclear weapons. Why doesn't he use it against Israel? I mean, those are these kind of extreme, absurd kind of uh, you know reactions that you get in Pakistan. But the worry is that Al Qaeda and all have also made statements, and with their kind of um, nexus with the ISIS and others, you might see. A rise in uh, in terrorism uh, in our region in South Asia, and perhaps uh, some more attacks on Jewish and other interests and Israel uh, could also happen. But so I think that is one of the dangers that we face uh, in in South Asia. Now, uh, what the impact of the conflict, uh, uh, you know, on on in South Asia has waned in the sense that. Uh, not too many people are now bothered very much about it, and they look they look uh, a little jaded when when this issue comes up and says, "Oh, this has been going on for. Oh, this is just another round. They will have another round later, etc." So this is the situation that we have. We are in today, 
And uh, it is doubtful that anybody can actually mediate. The only country which has tried and obviously not succeeded is the United States, which has the most, uh, most influential. And all the rhetoric that you see coming out of Iran and Turkey are, of course, rhetoric. I don't think they, they are in a position to, to, uh, to, to, to mediate or do anything of that sort. The only Arab country which has some influence is Egypt. But that too limited, I think. They have used it to, be, uh, to, to, get about, to bring about the ceasefire. And of course, I think the U.S. administration, uh, uh, President Biden, has been talking to Netanyahu to help in this process. I'd just like to um, just like to sum up what you said very quickly. One is you made the you made the point about the fact domestic politics uh, and how this will impact uh, Netanyahu's own chances. Also, the divisions in the among the Palestinians and the and this and the kind of distance now between the Arab world and the Palestinians, and also uh, what this impact what this is going to do for. Uh, terrorism in I mean how you red flagged the, uh, the possible rise of terrorist incidents in South Asia uh, because of this and across the world as well and also uh, how much change really has uh, change in administration in the US from Trump to Biden how much change uh, that itself has, uh, has brought about um, and these are all very interesting points and I and I and I hope uh, other speakers will also weigh in on this as as each uh, as, as each speaker comes up with their uh, own um, com the, their country's own uh, history um, and legacy on this issue. Uh, I now invite Lieutenant General uh, Lodi from uh, Pakistan, former Defence uh, Minister, and uh, former former Defence Secretary as well. To, uh, to make his presentation. So seven uh, minutes, as I said. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I hope I am audible. Uh, yes. Excellencies, uh, General, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, uh, for the GCTC uh, providing this forum to all of us to exchange our views. And I would start with my condolences uh, uh, with all those who lost their, their ones uh, in this uh, deadly pandemic. And especially Aditya Saab, who lost his sister. And uh, we hope that uh, this thing ends as soon as possible and we can uh, start uh, having life as normal. So what I'll do is that I'll not waste time uh, uh, about the genesis of the problem. I think it has been amply covered, starting from the Belfort Declaration until today. I will just uh, uh, like to have a review of all the UN resolutions uh, collectively and the agreements. I think uh, they, they, they are all for three points. And I'll just mention those points. Uh, first is, of course, uh, the two-country solution, right of Palestinian and Israelis both to exist. Uh, secondly, it is against the expanding settlements, Israeli settlements. And uh, third, of course, the status of Jerusalem, uh, which could be an international city uh, under some combined management or something. So this is the crux of you know, what all has been uh, uh, agreed uh, so far. As far as this present conflict is concerned, whatever happened in these uh, 11 days, that has been uh, uh, covered. So I will uh, save time. And uh, the only thing to mention is that more than 250 uh, people got killed on Palestinian side, including about more than 60 children, which is alarming, and uh, some casualties on the Israeli side also. So first, I will just uh, see that in these 11 days, uh, what uh, few political military objectives Israel attained, and I think they did attain few, and it was uh, mentioned by Excellency also was just talking. Uh, first of all, of course, they have, uh, I think, demonstrated uh, to the world once more that if, you, uh, if any country has enough political clout and some big power standing behind them, they don't care for international law or the civil society sentiments at large. Uh, secondly, they, they again exhibited that how U.S. stands solidly and firmly behind them. Uh, there's no need to go into details. Uh, their disproportionately overwhelming response uh, was to reestablish deterrence, which they did. This, this is what they always do, that uh, for any provocation, uh, they, they, uh, they resort uh, uh, in a way so that uh, you know, deterrence is established, uh, that for one, uh, they will uh, hit 100, let us say, something of that sort. And then, of course, 
the internal disharmony uh, has been temporarily removed as Nathan Howe escaped some pressure, uh, as was uh, said by my friend just a little earlier. Uh, what did Palestinians achieve? Uh, I think they, they did uh, succeed in drawing attention of the world uh, to its uh, unresolved issue, long-standing uh, unresolved issue. Uh, they tried some tactics to penetrate Iron Dome air defense system. And I think this should be uh, particularly interesting for both India and Pakistan. Uh, of course, they do some sympathies of the civil society at large. And maybe they might have learned a lesson or two as far as asymmetric warfare is concerned. Now, lessons for the world, and especially, I would say, for South Asia. And I will just list them. Uh, first of uh, I think, is that atrocities, uh, human rights violations, unjust political and uh, military tyranny cannot buy peace. Uh, I mean, you can, have, uh, you, can, you can be 100 times stronger than your opponent, but as long as you are not just uh, politically, ethically, probably uh, uh, you cannot uh, have peace in the region. Secondly, that uh, human minds uh, and their yearn for freedom uh, cannot be suppressed forever with force. Uh, it will keep on simmering, it will keep on, uh, keep on erupting uh, whenever it finds space and appropriate uh, you know, uh, environment. Uh, the third takeaway for us could be that uh, nuclear power alone is no guarantor of peace. We know that uh, uh, Israel is an uh, undeclared nuclear power, uh, but uh, you know uh, the, the, the inhibition and, of course, the restriction on use of that power, we all know, we all understand those who are here, all very wise people. So at times, uh, nuclear uh, power cannot uh, ensure that uh, you will not be attacked or there will be peace and you, will, uh, you can have uh, you know, uh, uh, peaceful periods. Uh, Political injustice and peace uh, cannot coexist. Uh, this we must all understand. I think it is uh, self-explanatory. And uh, unresolved issues uh, can keep uh, bringing havoc and devastation uh, for people of the region, wherever you know, wherever it exists. Uh, so the leadership of India and Pakistan uh, must uh, uh, try to find some amicable res uh, resolutions to all our outstanding issues including terrorism and Kashmir, uh, we must display foresight, wisdom, acumen to carve out space for uh, peace and prosperity. Otherwise, uh, the one and a half billion people will remain hostage uh, to the fear of either maximum nuclear winter or at least subjected to uh, poverty and misery. So I think this small episode of uh, 11 days uh, of course, uh, has a lot uh, uh, for the world to learn and for the world to see. And of course, uh, for us also, uh, the peoples and the governments of this region, uh, we can also learn a lot. And I've listed uh, some of the things which I thought uh, are relevant. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, General Lodi. Uh, I think uh, you made uh, some important uh, points and some very provocative points. Um, one of those, of course, being, um, you know, what lessons it holds for India and Pakistan and how uh, we should um, uh, resolve our unresolved issues. I think your, uh, the, the, the takeaways that you listed, you did not uh, say it, but you probably meant Kashmir. And, um, and, and the, the, the thing about it, I mean, this is something that we should, we should probably discuss as well. I mean, this is a provocative comparison that is often made um, in Kashmir itself, that it is, um, you know, the the Kashmiri issue is uh, like the like the Palestinian issue, uh, but there are of course different viewpoints on this, and they have Kashmiris have often compared their stone throwing protest to the Intifada, as well. And uh, but there are, as I said, there are other viewpoints, and one of them being that, you know, uh, if the Palestinians are fighting for land. Kashmiris already have land, so land is not the big issue there. But anyway, we will go into that uh, later. I will. Uh, 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 we should discuss this uh, when when the floor opens up. Um, I will now invite um, Ambassador Anil uh, Trigunayat, a uh, distinguished fellow at um, Vivekananda International Foundation, um, and former ambassador to Jordan, Libya, and Malta. 
to make this presentation. Seven minutes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dhrupaji, uh, and distinguished panelists. I'm really thankful to GCTC for inviting us today to discuss a very important issue that is called the world attention, once again. Uh, I fully agree, and my um, senior colleague, Ambassador Chakravarti, has already spoken about uh, the background, and uh, so did Swani, and therefore I feel that no point talking about it. I fully agree that uh, there have been issues but um, my take essentially is that what next? Uh, we have seen it. Many people who are despondents uh, would say that nothing will happen. After some time, it will be more of the same. There are a few conclusions that I have drawn out of it. Is One is this, this indeed was a political opportunism. We have seen that Netanyahu has been facing the uphill task, himself being under uh, legal complications in the country. And on the other hand, the Hamas leadership had been tried to or had agreed to patch up with the Fateh and Abbas group to hold the election. But when Abbas, President Abbas saw that his party was losing because there are a lot of splinter groups within their party, as well as the Israelis got together with them and they, they refused to allow uh, elections to be held. And that's when that uh, whatever little bond that the Hamas and uh, Fatah were able to put it has been ruptured. And therefore, in a situation which was internally building and nobody expected, not even the Americans, expected that this could go to this level. And that's when the Hamas sought the opportunity themselves and threatened Israel that you vacate the al aqsa Mosque compound, otherwise we'll fire rockets on you. And they did fire 200 rockets and that's what happened. What we have seen, Israel is the most powerful country militarily, technologically in the region. And therefore, there was no match in any case. What we have seen is that politically, these people have gained. And one sees today that Hamas has acquired a much greater acceptance and resilience across this. When we see in Ramallah, the uh, people really enjoying uh, the so-called victory that they call, even though both the people were at loss, the green flags of Hamas were all over there. So that shows that even though they have lost several of their commanders, because Israel has superb intelligence, and they used it to their best advantage. Second thing is that the Palestinian issue had been on the back burner all this while. For many years, we are seeing that there has been a fatigue among the Arab world. We have been seeing Abraham Accords going along, and there are probably more countries to follow. So what it has done is it's brought back again the Palestinian issue on the horizon, especially through the Arab Spring, putting the monarchs on the back foot. And therefore, what if you follow the OIC discussions, one would know that there was a tremendous, uh, you know, resistance uh, to further uh, doing that. So in my view, there uh, Israel has not been such a gainer uh, per se as a nation. Uh, they'll have a little while to bridge this difference. Thirdly, what we see is that uh, President Biden did not have at least except Iran as his priority at all. And he has been dragged back into it, not out of his volition, because if you see from the beginning when they were talking about, we saw he said the sustainable calm. Then from there, he moved to rather starting with indifference to sustainable calm to ceasefire. And now he is talking that there is no other solution except the two-state solution. So we are seeing a movement in that direction. We can't be naive about the complexities that exist there. But that is happening there now. The, among the regional countries, why Egypt and uh, Qatar played a great role was simply because they are very close to Hamas. So it was not necessarily an Israel-Palestine issue per se. It was more Israel-Hamas issue. And politically now, both will have to change their perception. While we know the 2006 Hamas had won the elections, but they were not allowed to uh, take over the power. And that's when the Gaza 2007 onwards, we have seen them being in Gaza and being attacked several times and this uh, have been happening. But this time, what we are seeing is the Hamas will have a much greater uh, negotiating power. And they will have to also abdicate denial of the existence of the state of Israel if at all something has to move. But my... Uh, one of the problems that I face is that UN resolutions that General Saab also talked about, 
it's no longer the same. What, what they, they all the, uh, they, especially the Palestinians, the Arabs wanted to Israel, uh, Palestine state to be on the 1967 borders. They're no longer there. We don't see them uh, at all. Now, whether all settlements will go, unlikely. What will happen is, I mean, one would go, I, I was not a great fan of Trump, but when he came with that policy and if it had been allowed uh, without the trust deficit, I think it would have moved somewhere for the Palestinians to have an estate and help and deconstruction. But this is an emotional issue. So how it will be handled? But I also feel that right now there is a little opportunity, little window that is open for the uh, regional countries, for the U.S. to take the lead, for other interlocutors. We are seeing China as emerging as a major, uh, at least uh, uh, a spokesperson for the Palestinians has offered to host the talks. So we have to see it from that point of view uh, that hopefully, and I think all of us should work, and India has been telling, and as was told earlier, that we hold this view about Palestine relations. I know that in 1992, when we were setting, uh, establishing diplomatic relations with uh, Israel, I was uh, looking after the desk in the Ministry of External Affairs, and we had spoken to Arafat. And Arafat told us, I'm very happy that you are uh, normalizing relations Israel, so that you can act as an interlocutor where, or for bringing a bridge uh, between us. But so we have that kind of situation. That's what we are. India has taken a very considered view and the statement of the United Nations Security Council that we are there and our PR has been working regularly with other uh, partners in this, even though I would say that because of the American stance, the Security Council has once again failed to even issue a statement. And uh, so that apart, we have today an opportunity, and I think that opportunity should be available. As far as South Asia is concerned, it is also a complex region. We cannot wish away our neighbors. We have to live with them. Neighbors are the gift of geography. We have to continue to grow together. That is extremely important. But the issues have to be taken on board. General Lodi mentioned some of them. And I think that we were on the right track when we were talking about We'll discuss terrorism and we will discuss Kashmir. We have agreed there have been mechanisms, but then we have to trust and move forward and show on the ground that there is definitely some improvement, that there is no complicity as far as extremist acts are concerned. So it is extremely important that a good neighborly feeling is also equally essential in order to move forward. We have seen there has been collaboration during this pandemic. Among all the countries, India, Pakistan, and we already have uh, some uh, ceasefire or, or, or movement and some interactions have been happening. We have, we, can, we have to work like two matured countries. And I hope uh, that we continue to forward first, put our own house in order. Second is to have the close uh, neighbors as partners in progress and development, and then move forward. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I think you uh, made an important point there about uh, uh, the, the gains for Hamas in this and the, and the losses uh, for Israel. Uh, also about how the Biden administration's uh, Biden's own uh, stand on this has uh, evolved as the days from day to day. So um, I, I think those were those were very important points. Also, the point of uh, living in um, living in peace in the in the in the neighborhood and uh, to to resolve yes, issues with good uh, with good uh, neighborly relations. I think all those are important points, and we will uh, we will discuss those as we go along. I now invite General Shokin Chauhan, as former Director General of the SM Rifles. And he's the executive council member, member of GCTC. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, good evening. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a very interesting subject. And I thought that, uh, you know, there are just, of course, one has been listening to uh, General Lodi and uh, the two ambassadors who've spoken uh, our view. Uh, I'm here to sort of, t uh, just, to, just to sort of, throw two, three issues here. Firstly, uh, the Indian relationship with uh, with Israel is one issue. The second is 
how does this pan out uh, in in our uh, in our discussions with what is actually happening on the ground and how will india uh, react and how should uh, rest of south asia react are issues uh, that probably need a little bit of uh, uh, elaboration and discussion the first issue uh, which i felt it's important uh, you know is who actually represents the palestinians uh, we 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 talking of hamas uh, we talking of uh, the palestine uh, the erstwhile plo uh, the issue is that even today whether israel stopped the election or not uh, who who represents the palestinians have the hamas won an election uh, the last election that was held was uh, was not won by the hamas they they may have won the gaza election but they didn't win the presidential elections but after that hamas has more or less you know uh, decided that they are the ones who are going to represent uh, the palestinians and it's 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 a very muscular approach to uh, the whatever little democracy that palestinians seen after the death of yasser arafat in uh, 2004 the leadership of the palestinian authority and the fatah passed to mohammed abbas and hamas strengthened its military might but also gained popularity because of this particular military might in 2005 when the second round of elections were held after israel had moved uh, withdrawn its military the fatah party won the PA, uh, president's uh, palestinian president's uh, election but hamas like i said earlier uh, had uh, were victorious in gaza in 2006 it affected a uh, coup in gaza against the palestinian authority president mohammed abbas to set up its rule after that there has been no, no election at all so hamas rules gaza and the fatah party administ- administers the west bank so every time israel and the palestinians fight it's a military battle between the israeli forces and the hamas uh, military might so somewhere along the line i feel that we missed this particular issue out uh, that there is a strong arming in the, in palestine in palestine what do the people of palestine actually feel jan lodi spoke of the number of children killed and uh, various other issues uh, you know various other people who were killed but what about the rest of the palestinian people why isn't there another voice coming out from palestine is is a question that we need to ask to talk talk about it and to find out as to how we are going to get something there because we are we must be very clear that till hamas is ruling palestine you will not have anything else but violence there we we can just whatever you want to say you can say the second issue is our own relationship with israel ambassador was absolutely right it's come out of the closet we are much closer to israel today i too have uh, in the course of my service uh, been to israel and spent a, spent a couple of uh, a couple of weeks there it's a close relationship with their military politically we have an issue about various other issues and those issues continue to talk to to decide our 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 relationship with israel but the most important thing is that since this affects our relationship uh with the the rest of west asia it's important for us to come out clear to say why doesn't the, why don't the palestinian people reinitiate this issue of elections and find out who actually represents them can a more moderate leadership emerge there and can something less militant happen in 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 palestine the the second issue uh jan lodi sir uh, you you mentioned the issue about uh, kashmir or at least wanted to link this issue with kashmir it the totally two different issues the chair has adequately answered this particular thing but uh, it has nothing to do with the situation in kashmir sir uh, it 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 is not even linked to uh, to kashmir there is a totally different organization and system functioning and and different dynamics that function in uh, in the israel palestine conflict which is not the issue in an internal matter of india so uh, thank you chair for giving me this opportunity i just thought that i would like to clarify who actually represents the palestinian people and why are the palestinian people trying to find out someone more moderate rather than continuing this 
love hate relationship with the hamas who, which will only bring them further and further and further into a point at which there will be no solution thank you thank you uh, general uh, chauhan uh, for your presentation and uh, for making uh, uh, you uh, your main point of course was that uh, there should be elections in palestine and the, that uh, there should somehow be a new leadership in palestine uh, something that's different from uh, the noticeably effete uh, uh, Palestinian Authority and the noticeably uh, militant uh, uh, Hamas. Uh, I mean, we we don't know. I mean, how that is uh, how we can uh, decide that. But well, I mean, uh, that has to be left to the people of Palestine to decide who they they want to back, uh, really. And um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, when you talk about a moderate leadership, I'm, I'm wondering if you think that the Palestine uh, Authority is not uh, moderate enough. Uh, usually it is considered moderate enough. And uh, the Biden administration has uh, actually uh, re-established uh, diplomatic ties with the- Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, fellow distinguished panelists, uh, the title, if I understand, Correctly, is Israel Palestine conflict implication of South Asia? I'm not an expert on South Asia, but I'll be, as I told Aditya, I'll be talking a little bit about India. Now, the as an academic, I'm an academic, uh, let me take the debate into different plane. Because when you say title Israel Palestine conflict, it somewhat undermines and dilutes the basic thrust of the whole entire crisis. For me, it is as simple as that. Israel occupation versus Palestinian resistance. When you think, you debate on all of those lines, many of things will be very clear. Why did I say that? Because it's basically an occupation versus resistance. Now, uh, let me give you a few sort of details at the cost of time. Now, so for 11 days of uh, war, you know, the, 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 this is what am I, I'm trying to contextualize. The continual, large scale death and destruction caused by Israel war mission in Gaza, at least since the last decade. There's a pattern about this. There's a pattern, familiar pattern. And I'm one of those who was not at all surprised by this uh, crisis and will not be surprised if one more crisis erupts after two, three years. There's a continual pattern on this. Why do I say that? Now, the details, uh, I think uh, 243 Palestinians have lost lives, 72,000 Palestinians have been displaced, 12 Israelis have been killed, uh, around 66 children have been killed and uh, 184 residential complexes have been destroyed, which includes six high-rise buildings, iconic buildings, which includes Al Jal locality and Masrit Media production also. Now, why did I say this? Because there's a pattern, you know, there is a three basic features of Israel policy towards Gaza ever since, ever since, towards the Palestinian general and Gaza in particular ever since 2000. Nine. That is why Netanyahu became the prime minister for second time. The operation cast led was before that. Now the pattern is now one thing. The, the, the you know I know creating a pretext to justify an attack. Please note these patterns: inflicting heavy punishment and the entire population, collective punishment through large-scale destruction, and deliberate cleaning of civilians through the use of disproportionate military power. Now why is it that? Because you know that the point, the point is, this is a part of Israel's long-term strategy. Long-term strategy of what? Long-term strategy of depalestinization, what I call it, depopulate Palestine. To crush Palestinian resistance, to deny their basic rights, and to deny their basic identity. This is what I try to contextualize. What are the reasons for this? There are various reasons, to briefly, ideological, strategic and political. What is ideological? I think Ambassador Pinan Chakravarti briefly hinted that. You must understand, um, fellow panelists and uh, audience, that there has been an extraordinary neo-Zionist consensus in Israel since the Second Intifada. What does that mean? When you say neo-Zionist, there are three different phases, Zionism, post-Zionism, neo-Zionism. You know, neo-Zionist consensus means now the debate is placed within Israel. It is being, you know, framed in such a way that Israel is still fighting its existential battle with the Palestinians, particularly the Arab Palestinians within Israel and beyond that, the Palestinian occupied territory. 
So if you say neo Zionist consensus, the neo Zionist consensus revolves around the idea, very idea of Israel. What is that of idea Israel? Let's give it now. Neo Zionist consensus that the idea of Israel is pre 1967 Israel, mandatory Palestine, that includes Golan Heights. This is you have to understand Trump's policy. So that the whole debate is around that the right wing extremists, the secular movement. So they are moving towards that. And ever since 2000, second Intifada, it has been there. As far as other political forces, they are totally marginalized or sidelined. Except the leftist and the post Zionists, nobody is in a position to oppose this neo Zionist concept. It's penetrating everywhere. Professor Elan Pape has brilliantly expressed this in the, his book, Idea of Israel. You know, that is what is it. So, therefore, now coming to the briefly strategic, what is the strategic reason? This is where there are always, behind any Israel operation, you have the immediate context, the long term context. Immediate context, you all know. Sheikh Zara expulsion, the from Bevixen and Silvan, then the violence in the Al Aqsa Mosque, the NPF police force in the Al Aqsa Mosque, then the Hamas response. There is a pretext. There is also a pretext, a provocation to Hamas to do something, to fire certain rockets, and so that Israel justifies the attack, the massive attack, disproportionate attack through its awesome military strength. You must understand there is a if you say the conflict you, you know you, you don't you, you don't try to capture the lessons there is a vast asymmetry of military power vast asymmetry of military power you must understand that also military strength the way they are pounding every day the buildings okay now the long-term objective is all, always as i should do depopulate palestine this is this is in consonance with the neo zionist consensus Israel to have a land of Israel, to claim the land of Israel, greater Israel. So it is pursued in West Bank, very silently, very in a creeping manner. By what? By building a racist apartheid regime, building the wall, settlements, and confusion land, so on and so on. In Gaza, it has been pursued, being pursued through a heavily military approach. Ever since 2007, when Gaza came under Hamas, uh, ever since Operation Castle. Why is it so? Why Israel is following a heavily militarist policy towards Gaza. Because Hamas, targeting Hamas, targeting Hamas terrorism. So I'm not one of those who firmly believes this is a debate about right to self-defense and terrorism. This takes a different thing. This, this is not normal law. Right to self-defense, yes, Israel has every right to defend itself. Israel is a committee of nations. We all have to recognize it. There's no doubt about that. There is no question of that. But if Israel has a right to exist, do the Palestinians have the right to live and survive? That's a question we all have to ask. This is what the occupation versus Palestinian legislation. Therefore, if you concentrate on Hamas, it serves Israel's purpose. It serves in purpose always for domestic and international consumption. For domestic, the securitization of political discourse. You securitize that. We are under threat. We are under constant threat. So the right wing forces get strengthened and get strangled over. Okay? Now, and in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, and because you know, Hamas has been um, branded as a terrorist organization by the US, by the European and so on and so forth. So this is a terrorism, threat from terrorism, where are fighting for our existence. That is where exactly. And, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that is where. And on the other hand, if you keep on hurting, keep on targeting Hamas, the most important advantage for Israel political leadership, particularly Netanyahu, who has been there for since 2009, is to dodge the peace process. To dodge the peace process, to sabotage the peace process. Because then you say, you, your whole narrative is look, there is a terrorist threat. There is no one to talk. Hamas is not recognized. So we are concerned with Hamas. Because once Hamas is finished, and you will be forced to talk to PA, then you can't say we have no one to negotiate with. Therefore, my argument has been that if Israel wants, with its awesome military strength, it can finish and demolish Hamas within one day. Why is it not doing? Why is it not doing? Because this is what I call the strategic weakening of Hamas or staggered crushing, off and on. There has to be some pretext, some pretext. And by this way, it wants to achieve two things. One, depopulate, because the Palestinians will be forced to leave under occupation or leave Palestine, L-E-A-V-E, leave Palestine. And by constantly harping on Hamas, Israel wants to create a dissonance within the Palestinian Gaza so that the Palestinians rise against Hamas, that is not happening. That is the irony of Israel. That is not happening. In fact, the more they are crossed, the more becomes their determination. They rise from the ashes. 
that's palestinian resistance okay therefore now the the, 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 the therefore you know from a hamas therefore it is it is it serves its real purpose particularly right wing politicians to keep hamas from time to time hard to end, okay then create a problem and it could create a pretext and attack that now hamas perspective hamas again another point why hamas is there is a point of strategies within the palestinians and many of you have pointed out i will not be agreeing with those that palestinians are divided this is a consequence rather than the cause of the palestinian problem it's a consequence division because israel knows very well divide and conquer divide and rule that's happening so let's leave it to palestinians how they come to unite if they are united you know 2014 what happened they were about to form a united unity government and you have operation protective rights timing has to be understood israel has to you know demolish everything now therefore now hamas perspective is yes we are fighting an occupation under international law no occupying power has any authority to change any feature of the land it occupies and the occupiers has a right to resist in which way they can that's international law in other words the indian british call as terrorist french call algerian terrorist so we do we take it think it that way so therefore they say it's an but the difference is hamas there's a strategy in within the palestinian movement the hamas believes in armed resistance fatah believes in peaceful coexistence so that is what armed resistance but also please remember there is a lot of misperception about hamas the whole world is living remains fossilized in 1988 hamas document founding document yes it is a national resistance organization with an islamist bent of mind yes that card charter clearly says that they don't recognize israel but over the years hamas has moderated itself enough please see the clear carefully khalid misal the leader in 2007 he was asked a very simple question do you recognize israel his point blank answer was it is not a question of recognizing israel it is a question of recognizing palestine otherwise if you have give us palestine we will recognize 2014 there is a foundational document hamas has come out which clearly says that it is prepared to accept a solution along this 1967 borders how many of are the western analysts highlighting that hamas has come to, but you, you may ask a question why hamas is not moderating the way arafat led fatah did completely renounce violence because it has learned a lesson from arafat's experience what did arafat gain therefore they say unless we get something in concrete that we cannot we will not do that is the point now the another reason is so the object is cross palestinian resistance the immediate the political dividends you know netanyahu has been the greatest gainer for all this ever since he came to power in 2009 you know everybody is so there is there's a political dividends this political dividends always are further it's almost understand that new gaza has become a laboratory for testing new weapons there are documentary evidences for that i've read enough from that in new document new laboratory and latest american weapons which violates american law which are used against civilians which violates american law so therefore the reason why why it is israel is succeeding the way it is doing why it is israel aggressive in relation to against hamas is succeeding three brief reasons one blind us support uncritical you 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 support arab apathy and the lack of effective international intervention i am not going to discuss in detail this coming to india now india in my you know in fact i am arguing along the lines which i have been writing and one of the articles abraham records and options before india is will be soon published this is where i think india in my opinion now is most suitably placed most suitably placed to play some meaningful proactive role i am measuring my words meaningful proactive low profile role behind the scene not high profile diplomacy and this is where because you have relations with all the actors involved all the important actors us fatah hamas israel and most important now uae and saudi arabia i am one of those who now do not count much on egypt's role as a mediator it's saudis and you which, which are going to play a key role so we have re- good relations with all the actors and our main national interest is stability in this region and i'm very pleased and the, our stand in the in the security council clearly reflects that what is our parent of tr tilmut said two things our strong commitment to palestinian cause strong support to palestinian cause and strong commitment to two state solution that is what made an 
is talking today. Two state solution, it has become a chimera. It's a, it's a mirage. Because very fast, Israel is always trying to create facts on the ground so to make two state state almost redundant and almost nullified. So therefore, India, it is time has come. It depends politically. We have strong political leadership. Time has come to try to convince. And Palestinians, let me tell you, are looking towards India more than the US. The problem with the Palestinians, that's what the US is concerned. This is the perennial dilemma which Arafat faced and every, every Palestinian leader will face. On the one hand, US, because of US, Israel is doing what it is doing. But for US, Israel is almost cannot do anything. Second, at the same time, they know if anyone, any power in the, in the, in, in the world which can pressurize or persuade Israel to make compromises, genuine compromises, now is the US. The, the positive sign is within the US, there is a huge debate. The new discourse is going on. New discourse is going on. That the lower rank people are questioning US unquestioned support to Israel. Younger Jews, they are questioning. So the debate is going to what extent unquestioned support to Israel is a strategic asset for us. John Mirsmer has argued long back that is now gaining ground. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pradhan, for uh, uh, for this uh, you know masterly you know uh, uh, presentation on all the issues that are involved. I I uh, I agree with uh, many of the things that you said, including the uh, secur securitization of uh, the internal political discourse in Israel and uh, uh, how uh, Hamas has become necessary for uh, Israel to uh, divert attentions from, uh, you know, uh, from talking peace and how um, it could actually destroy uh, Hamas in a day because uh, the two sides are so unevenly matched and you can see that in uh, in the casualties in the in the in the last uh, 11 days um, that they had that uh, conflict and uh, also uh, um, uh, uh, very interesting point about how uh, India can play uh, a role in uh, uh, a behind the scenes role a uh, very provocative point uh, uh, let's see how many people uh, uh, have uh, opinions on that, and uh, uh, because you're saying because we have now friendly ties with UAE and with uh, Saudi particularly, and plus uh, we are, we have good relations with uh, um, uh, Netanyahu. I mean, Modi has good relations. Prime Minister Modi good relations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Israel and India have good relations. Have had uh, growing relations in the last five years. Plus, uh, the Palestinians you say are looking up to us. I don't know. Um, I. Uh, I don't know how much they're looking up to us, uh, but uh, uh, I, I hope there are more questions uh, uh, on this. And uh, we, I'll go to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Bayal Awad, Awad, Senior International uh, Independent Journalist and Political Analyst. And uh, he, uh, he was former president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia. Welcome. Uh, I'm handing over the mic to you. Thank you very much, Nirupama, for the invitation, and thank you for the Global Council of Counterterrorism for inviting me in a short notice where I could not say no, but such a distinguished guest on the panel that I have to speak and to highlight certain points which have many of you have already ego, but I would like to go a little back down in the history because we had, with the current events happening in the Middle East, we have seen what happened is that we had to commemorate two memories. One is the first Zionist organization a century ago of they have met and they have decided to create the state of Israel and a Jewish state in Palestine. And then we had also the second one was the Nakba, 1973 years ago, where we had the Palestinians have been kicked out of their homes and to achieve what the British have promised. The Jewish who have been kicked from 79 countries all over the world, but they were always be sheltered among their cousins, the Muslim, under the Muslim era, and they have never been kicked, and they have been respected as a religion into our own society. But Belfort Declaration in 1917 have set the stage for dividing, or for giving, not even dividing, by the way, to give the whole of Palestine to the Israelis at the cost of the Palestinians. Though the mandate for Britain when they have taken the occupied Palestine in 1922, it was meant actually for 
10 years mandate and that's when the uh, the league of the nation and they have violated even the league of the nation uh, uh, um, um, the orders and they have occupied and they start making sure most of the immigration and the jewish refugees are coming from all over europe till we had the holocaust where the uh, even uh, we had the havara the uh, the deal agreement between the zionist movement and the, uh, Nazi Germany, Hitler, that they should be leaving and they were uh, facilitating their departure from Germany uh, into the Palestine and into all over the world, where even they were denied, in fact, entry into America uh, and some of the refugees, even Canada or America, were denied in the early years. So there was the action into Palestine and Palestine was the only destination after they have rejected many issues whether it's in South Africa, whether it should be in Canada or the United States, or even in, in, in Russia. The, the whole idea was that there is some uh, linkage, religious linkage to this part. So what started as a colonial enclave, creating a state within a state, is actually a violation of even the United Nations Charter. Even the General Assembly, which we speak about the 181 resolution of the UN Security Council, that they have divided Palestine into two, the General Assembly, where the Britain have brought it into the General Assembly to discuss the Palestinian issue, was meant to divide Palestine into two. And there was a committee which formed by the UN at that time. And we know that that committee, 181, had, well, the committee 106 resolution, they have made a committee. And that committee went and made the study of the Palestinian issue. And according to that study, which is also documented in the United Nations, and it is available to everyone, they have made it very clear that there are 65% of the Palestinians are, the uh, Arabs are living in Palestine. 33%, after all this exodus of the Jewish migrants from Europe, still they were 33% with 7% of the actual historical Palestine. If we remember these figures, then we know that the division of Palestine was not meant to create two-state solution. In fact, as I have been listening to the previous speaker, Professor Ben Siddharth, it was meant to create Israel at the cost of the Palestinians. So if we understand the historical background and we know that the UN body does not have the jurisdictic system or the legitimacy to divide or to replace a nation with a nation, then the whole issue of UN Charter is at, 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 at debate, that it has really created a rift within on its own charter. There is no question of creating a state at the cost of another state. That's the issue. So we have agreed that this Palestine has divided, and even the British themselves said we are able to protect or implement the UN Security Council resolution because if there is a violence, they have armed, they have equipped, they have trained all the terrorist organization of the right wing Jewish who have come from Europe. We have no connection with the Middle East or West Asia or the Arabs or the Jewish of our own our own people and cousins. The problem here started, and then we know the, the massacre after massacre, what happened in Palestine, till we reached to a stage of where the United States itself position. I'm trying to take UK as the main culprit. I'm going to speak to US as the one who facilitated, because even US pulled out of the 181 resolution. They said, they, provided they don't implement it within only 10 days, provided that they don't implement it forcibly and by force. So there was no Article 7 that this is a country being invaded, that is a country being uh, divided. And we have, the things continue because most of the Arab leaders post-independent, they have been taken by the British or the French, put into power even without the legitimacy of their own population. That we all know what happened because they were worried of the communism, they were worried of uh, Islamization, and that is where they have started giving them hastily independent to be, and the Palestine was, gradually, systematically been annihilated till we reach to a stage where we reach to the invasion of Iraq. And I'm bringing here because I wanted to know the legitimacy of UN dividing the, Arab, the uh, Palestine. But when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, we had the whole UN Security Council. They put him in ch Chapter 7, uh, Article 7 of the UN, that this is an invasion of a different nation. The whole world, including the Arab states, have stood with the American coalition to liberate Kuwait. And when we, we negotiated with the American, why you want us to liberate Kuwait, but you don't want us to liberate Palestine? So, well, we will go for a uh, conference. George Bush have said, and everything documented, and everybody knows. 
and it was agreed that Madrid conference should go. We should have a Madrid conference, and the, after which we would go for a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian crisis and Arab-Israeli. After that, all the Arab countries have agreed that we should go to the Land for Peace uh, formula. Madrid conference, Kuwait was liberated. Madrid conference, Ishaq Rabin went to United States. He gave even, we call it Rabin assets, has given to President Bill Clinton, uh, George Bush, and he gave him that we have, we will, uh, we will vacate the Syrian Golan up to the line of 4th of June 1967 war. That was given and it's in the American, uh, it is with the American. So all this was agreed, that's why we went to Madrid conference. After which we have seen that the uh, Israel governed operation with Arafat, with, uh, with, the, with Jordan, we came up with Oslo, 1993, which Oslo itself is a betrayal of the Palestinian cause, where Arafat have surrendered 78% of actual Palestine to Israel, recognized it, and he was demanding only 22% of Palestine within five years of transitional period that he will be a president, because he read at the back of the book, at the end page, there will be creation of Palestinian state. That was all, but what is each article being written? It is a question that it needs a debate and needs research for each one of the researchers to find out what was behind all this tamasha and hangama they have created that he have signed, even his own team have pulled out because he knew that this is not actually Palestine, which we have fought for it. And we fought in 1948 for division because when you want to divide two countries, you have 7% of the total territories of Palestine and you give them under UN Security Council resolution, 55% of historical Palestine. I think none of, nobody in the world will accept it. Nobody in family, if you divide the family house, the father or the father die, it has to be distributed equally. But if you are having only 7% and you give me 55% of actual Palestine, I think there was a major mistake. That's why I always call there's a moral responsibility of the UN to do, to make the amend the grave mistake they have done in dividing Palestine and giving only creation of Israel without creating of Palestine. So then we had Wadi Arafat. We had come David, of course, 78, 79, where Egypt was a sideline. The whole issue I'm trying to say here we started with massacres against the actual inhabitant Palestinian, and we continue till Sheikh al Jarrah issue where the current crisis is. The current crisis was not Gaza, by the way. The current crisis was East Jerusalem because Jerusalem has been kept as an international capital because it is important for the Christians as much as for the Judaism, as much as for the Islam. So Christianity, Islam, Judaism is an international city. That's why they have given it a special status, even in the resolution. Now, when you are going there and you have made Oslo agreement, we had 125,000 sectors inside West Bank and the occupied territories. Within Oslo agreement, we had 738,000 settlers in occupied territories have been created inside Palestine. And you're calling it a peace, and that is the peace deal that Israel wanted to go for peace. I met with, with Chairman Arafat. 22 years ago, 1999, 98. I asked him when Netanyahu, when Netanyahu had been the first prime minister at that time, first tenure. I said, what do you expect from Netanyahu? I asked the question three times and I have been saying it on TV many times. He said, nothing. I don't expect from him anything, nothing. The Likud party, the right wing came because we know that 1993, we had 55% of the Jewish in Israel who wanted peace with the Arabs. When the Likud party and the right wing came, immediately that formula, that, that status has changed into 10 to 15 percent who wanted to have peace with the Arabs. After that, we had also, I had 10 years ago, I also interviewed President Mahmoud Abbas. And Mahmoud Abbas, I raised the same question to him. And Mahmoud Abbas' answer was talk for talk. He knew that he cannot get anything from, from uh, Netanyahu. And then when the Israeli give us their, their side of the story, they say there is no peace from the Palestinians who want peace with us, they want to throw us to the sea. That's the story, as Jamal Abdul Nasser said. But believe me, if you go a little back in history, it was David Ben Gurion who said that they want, they want, the Arab want to throw us to the sea. But we foolishly adopted that uh, slogan, and we have said, see, the Arabs say. But if you go to history, it is David Ben Gurion. Go to see. So what I'm trying to say here is, Sheikh Al Jarrah is a province within East Jerusalem, and it is next to Al-Aqsa. And the Jewish uh, settlers have been trying by force, by weapon, they are weaponizing them, terrorizing the people there. They have to take this 
uh, enclave because that is how you wanted to create only a Jewish capital of Israel is eternal capital. So when we have President Trump, who has given the legitimacy of 10,000 miles away, that he is legitimizing an eternal capital for Israel, Jerusalem, he has no right to give even the Syrian Golan to Israel, as he also adopted that resolution and gave it to them. So you are rewarding the thief of a nation. Here we have to see the crux of the problem is, is then when they wanted to take it by force and they have started attacking the prayers inside the Laksa Mosque, we have seen that these prayers in the Laksa Mosque, they were the holiest night of all, which is, we call it Layla to Qadr, where we believe that as the Prophet had traveled from, uh, from Masjid al-Aqsa, I mean Masjid al-Haram al Masjid al-Aqsa, he went from Mecca to Medina to, to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. It is a holistic for the, most of the people. They are defenseless people praying. And everybody wish God that he should have peace and he should be enlightened to see that night. And then you're attacking them, you provoke them, and that is why Hamas have retaliated. So I here I wanted to say, which I always say, Hamas helped Netanyahu. Hamas actually created by the Israelis. As much as Hezbollah was created by the Israelis. When 1967 uh, annexation of Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza, it was the Muslim, the Islamic people, the Hamas has been created to defend, to defend, to resist occupation. When, when, when Ariel Sharon in Israel invaded, invaded Lebanon, then we had Hezbollah and every basic terrorist organization. They were formed because Israel occupied. So unless and until we finish occupation, there is no end resolution. Now you come and tell me that they have broke a deal. What Israel had eight months have been planning to destroy Hamas infrastructure, Jihad al-Islami infrastructure, the Qaib al-Qassam infrastructure inside Gaza Strip because they had the deal of the century, which has been promoted by the American, by President Trump and his son in law Kushner and Netanyahu, that now there is no question of a two-state solution and the Palestinian has to find some other way. As per the uh, Zionist Organization First Conference, they could be confederation with Jordan. Maybe later on we can, even Jordan too close to them, they feel that this is their backyard. Okay, they can go to Iraq. That's the plan, actually, if you look at the actual plan of the history background. So now, you attack the infrastructure of Hamas, and Hamas attacked you with this rocket. And you had 180 sorties by airplane, 180 airplane a day, three times, attacking a small geographic area where you have no infrastructure, you have no ditches to send the people, you have no uh, you have open yard to go, and you're bombing them in front of the public and the world opinion, and you expect us for 73 years to believe that you are a victim of terrorism and aggressions, and they are the victim and we are the aggressor. There is no, the whole world have accepted that there is a certain problem within this right-wing government who have deceived even his own people. By the way, one of his cases is against the media, where he tried to manipulate the media and he will go to jail for it. Of course, he has been indicted by the, the Israeli court. He delayed the indictment because the opposition in Israel had only one month. All of us know. He had one month to form a government and he, had, he can survive that month in the immunity. Immunity that he is still the prime minister. So when you're creating a war with, with Hamas and with the Palestinians, he wanted the Israeli to rally behind him. Because when the century deals failed, the deal of the century failed, they started talking of Abraham Accord. Even Trump started putting pressure on Arab leaders to force them into deal with Israel, to normalize relations with Israel. And all of them were saying, we want it because we wanted to solve the Palestinian problem. Now, can you tell me if, if Camp David failed, why the Arab failed, Oslo failed, and even this deal of the century failed, and even the now Abraham Accord is failing. Where is the Palestinian issue here is? So the winner in this game is definitely the right-wing extremist, European inside Israel, who have taken the full advantage of the actual Palestinian and historical. The target for them now is the 1.8 million Palestinians who accepted the identity of Israel in 1948, where they don't have even a right of, as a citizen. They, have, they are considered as a second and third class citizen inside Israel, and also they are trying to take any time their land and their house. They have already said, and I'm going to give me two minutes more. They are also going to take their home because Israel only democracy for the Jew. Remember this. Democracy is only for the Jewish people. 
They have, can bring hundreds of nationalities, but being a Jew, you are entitled to get an Israeli nationality. You are entitled to take a, a Palestinian house. You are entitled to build up anything you want. But a Palestinian cannot build up a bathroom in Jerusalem if he wanted to take permission. Even that bathroom, even if his daughter gets married, they will kick her out of the Jerusalem. She cannot bring her husband inside Jerusalem. So you can understand the apartheid attitude of a regime that we have seen it in South Africa has been diminished politically, but it is still controlling South Africa economically. It has been implemented inside Palestine. And that is the crux of the problem. There is an occupation. There is a colonization. It has to end. What happened in Hamas, the ceasefire now, what happened? You stop bombing them, they stop bombing you. But where is the real story? Go back to Sheikh al-Jarrah. The, I am talking to people. They are totally enclaved, in siege. Nobody can, even family cannot visit each other. They are all surrounded by the right-wing settlers who are all armed. They are protected by the Israeli army. Israeli army is only controlling the Palestinian while he cannot enter a, 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 a house of an Israeli because they are Israeli under the police custody and coverage, but not the army is only against the Palestinian and the Palestinian origin who have taken the Israeli identity. So let us be realistic in the issues because what happened is we have an impact on South, South Asia. And I came onto this session to speak because I know how grave dangerous it is. Al-Aqsa Mosque is in danger, and that is the issue here. Suppressing the resistance in Gaza, letting Hamas, Egypt, and Qatar funding and trying to now channelize it through to reduce Hamas influence in the region. And at the same time, they wanted to make sure that the Islamic fa- favor or favor reached to South and Southeast Asia because the, or the land is mushroomed now. It is not fertile for terrorism, for extremism, for a pretext for other nations to attack these people who are sympathizing with the Palestinian cause because they have finished. Margaret Thatcher said, communism has finished. And then they asked her, why don't you dissolve NATO? She said, we don't dissolve NATO because there is Islamophobia and we have the Islam to attack it. So if the Muslim people countries are going to be attacked and the target for this to South Asia is going to be the hot spot for this because when they went to Afghanistan, they created Al-Qaeda, and they have created Al- ISIS in Syria and, and Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Because it was a project, a tool used to achieve political objective. They went back to Syria and invaded unilaterally Iraq, uh, along with the Britain. And they, have, they know that this project has to be implemented. And after the Arab Spring, we have seen what happened inside Syria, what's happening in Yemen, what happened in Libya, and what's happening inside Iraq right now. It is all the turmoil and destabilizing, disintegration of this part of the world is part of the major projection of this. Because another major point here, which is very important, discovery of gas and oil in the Mediterranean, where also Gaza have a large share of this gas, will not be allowed to be shared by the Palestinians. They wanted the Egyptian or to administer it, or the Israelis deny the, uh, the Palestinians their own wealth and their own territory. So there is a wider perspective, there is a regional perspective, and there is a danger coming to this part of the world because we know terrorism is coming back to Afghanistan, terrorism is coming back to South Asia. It's not because the uh, Afghani people want it, no. Because we know that they have been siphoning ISIS terrorist organization by separately covert operation from Syria and Iraq into Afghanistan to create another hub of terrorism and to create this problem. Unless and until we, we strike, we address the issue. And it is true spirit, we are going to fall at the trap, whether I am a pro-Palestinian or I'm a, a pro-Israeli, I'm an anti-Arabs uh, or anti-Muslim, leave aside all these things, fasten your belt, find a way, because India, South Asia, uh, is not only geographically in South Asia. India is a stakeholder in South Asia and in West Asian affairs. India is a natural extension and expansion into West Asian affairs. And let's see, a, 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 a reasonable and wiser leader in this world can take us in this instable new world order. Unless and until we talk of a multipolar order of restructuring the United Nations, I think we are heading for more trouble. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vayal. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I think I'm not going to sum up because uh, there's no time now, so I'm just going to go to the uh, next speaker who is... May I invite uh, Major General uh, Ekanayke of the uh, Sri Lankan, formerly of the Sri Lankan Army, uh, to make his presentation. Uh, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure 
and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, forum today uh, and thank you very much when it comes to the perspective of sri lanka as a member of the south east south asian nations it's a human catastrophe that takes place where my country being a member of the group of south asian nations extends solidarity even though we are 3000 to 5400 kilometers away from that very land palestine south asia defined in both geographical and ethno cultural terms affiliated to palestine people the area that we are going to talk about the gaza strip and also the west bank where less than 2 million population in a square kilometer of 363 in gaza strip and 2.7 million population where west bank in a area of 5860 square meters where these Palestinian people are staying, and the economic mainstay of the people is production of fruits, truck crops, wheat, and olive, so on and so forth. In that very conflict, Jerusalem is a key fault line in the Israel-Palestine conflict. In this conflict, Palestine map, I could say, it's similar to Swiss cheese. having many holes like spots where population is decreasing over the years since creation of state of palestine uh, palestine and uh, creation of israel in the area of palestine palestine maintains relations with 115 countries world over including un in contrary israel maintains diplomatic relations with 164 countries in the recent conflict we can see muslim majority nations of south asia have issued a rare joint statement condemning israel assault on occupied palestinian territory as fighting between the israel defense forces and militant group hamas continued into second week even though at present there is israel this is a blatant violation of human rights repeatedly over the years the aggression carried out by the israelis targeting civilians throughout the occupied palestinian territory deemed inhuman particularly in east jerusalem and the gaza strip which has killed injured and caused suffering to many including women and children when it comes to the in this i would like to talk on the line of diplomatic relations and trade relations and demographic statistics and also in relation to the ratified ihl treaty and now we can see when it comes to the diplomatic relations in south asian nations perspective we can see afghanistan bangladesh maldives and pakistan do not maintain relations with israel but on the contrary bhutan india and nepal and sri lanka maintains relations while all these countries to maintain exports and imports that is trade relations between these countries and when it comes to demographic affiliations some of the countries are mainly populated with muslim population and some are not in that context there could be even though all the nations joined hand in condemning israel's atrocities the amount of pressure the each government and the groups exerting on the government should be more and when it comes to these countries afghanistan has ratified ihl and as it is shown in the screen these are the countries who have ratified ihl treaties here considering the atrocities carried out by israelis if we talk about ihl principles we could see the destruction of civilian buildings and combatant areas the atrocities conducted by israel is enormous and when it comes to ihl principles we can see 
the blatant violation of all these principles distinction between civilians and combatants where israelis have not identified or obeyed this principle and also in the context of prohibition of attack force we combat again the israel atrocities are enormous and prohibition to inflict unnecessary suffering of the civilian people living in this area is again it is enormous and also when it comes to the exerting pressure and also conducting war it is again the against the principles of necessity in this context i could see even though world nations are coming together with the backing of the us israel is going to stop this atrocities against palestine people now as a conclusion to this we could see majority of the countries have either condemned the israel aggression and emphasized de escalation of violence immediately also there will be aggravated diplomatic and political tension hovering world over with more protest stage against israel while extending solidarity towards palestine people nevertheless usa would continue to stand by israel at the security council and also it is unlikely that the trade between israel and majority of muslim dominated south asian nations and world over would have negative effects than prevalent but other segments of the nations world over would continue with trade next it is a sub in some of the south asian states there would be mass agitations for cessation of diplomatic relations with israel but i doubt whether this would be again a reality ideological influence sizable segment of youth in south asian countries as we have experienced when it came to the isis and also the muslim dominated world may opt to join movements like muslim brotherhood and isis in future entire peace loving south asian nations would join hands in extending solidarity towards palestinians nevertheless analyzing present context of world affairs it is unlikely right of palestinians would be solved rather as per the jews mega plan extinction of palestinians would be a fact evident in future as i mentioned as a swiss cheese the palestinian population becoming just only holes in this palestine land finally even though entire muslim world which is approximately 25 million population 25% of the world population this problem would not be solved so thank you very much oh thank you general like naike oh. thank you a lot um i will uh Now move on to the uh, next speaker, uh, who's been waiting very patiently, uh, Syed Salman Chishti of the uh, Chairman of the Chishti Foundation. Uh, can you please make your presentation, sir? The yeah, Adab greeting of peace to all of you, and uh, rather this is uh, more of a very serious implication and note that has uh, the world has witnessed. over the past two weeks and uh, especially when we are talking about the south asia perspective uh, before india made an official statement uh, at the un and the official uh, stand of india in regard with the just palestinian cause and standing by the two state uh, resolution at the un we have seen the surge on social media uh the implications of uh, the provocations and the bombing the killing by the idfs not only into the palestinian region or the gaza region but also there were some major implications in south asia particularly india especially over the social media there were many trends which were put up by different groups and uh, countering each other uh but of course when india made an official statement at the un lot of uh, negative trends were put to rest uh, as uh, india has been very clear uh, right from 1948 about it's just supporting the just palestinian cause 
uh, a clip of uh, a three time former prime minister atal bihari vajpayee has been also widely circulated where he clearly spoke to a large gathering about uh, the aggression of the israelis on the arab land and to bring the resounding and stable peace atmosphere they must give the rights to the palestinian where they are and not keep on encroaching or disbanding them from their own homes as we have seen in the latest escalation which uh, has been uh, brought to the world by the bombing in gaza but prior to that what the exact uh, provocation which were mentioned by uh professor uh prasad and then also with uh, dr bail awad that he spoke about the issues in the regions of the conflicts uh, the recent conflict was sheikh jarrah a neighbor in east jerusalem which is primarily uh, predominantly uh, a palestinian uh, muslim neighborhood uh, now the new settlements and new settlers have been invited from uh, uh, up class uh, jewish families from brooklyn to a lot of uh, american states and uh, different parts of europe to come and settle in there and that was the provocation that led to the protest inside the haram al sharif uh, bait al muqaddas where we were fortunate to be paid our respect to years back along with ambassador anil sahab who spoke so eloquently as in his diplomatic and ambassadorial position that he has served india in in, in the best manners uh, that inside the haram sharif it is totally unacceptable not only for the people in jerusalem or in gaza or palestine but around the world as it is emotional and a very spiritual attachment to to muslims especially in the last 10 days of ramzan where on the 26th of ramzan which is the laylatul qadr which is the night uh, of uh, prayer and deep contemplation and the revelation of the quran Uh, was uh, completed uh, on the 26th of Ramadan to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in that night, uh, seeing those images coming from Haram al Sharif, which we can't really think uh, that the IDF would barge into, and then uh, throw grenades to the people who are in congregation, they were not even holding, as some of the Reuters or some of the news has been circulated, fake news, that they were holding. Uh, mallet of uh, cocktails or some kind of uh, uh, retaliatory uh, weapons with them which is totally fake i have been to uh, baitul muqaddas and it is impossible to pass the idf uh, barracks before reaching the entrance of the masjid by by even carrying a pin in your bag they was they they search you in and out so to uh, reassert that it was from the both side it is completely unethical and india has rightly positioned itself at the un for the just palestinian cause and i think uh, this is the time that out beyond the un india must reassert its position in the peace process in the dialogues similarly as afghanistan peace process is on the table and india is now at one of the central spaces there talking uh, to the peace process in afghanistan and likewise india has that potential uh, it has always carried the potential uh, both diplomatically the soft power uh, and it is not only in india i was reading uh, one of the news that uh, the major southeast asian countries including malaysia indonesia brunei and all the south asian countries have unequally extended the support of the un to the just palestinian cause in line with india's position so it's the whole of south asia and india is surely is in position to lead this voice amplify that voice as uh, being the second largest muslim populated country after indonesia obviously muslims in india are hurt they were uh, provoked by the trends which were against uh, uh, the faith against the the situation which is happening uh obviously in india we are having our own situation of pandemic and uh, uh, there are complete lockdowns in the major cities and the major towns and people have been following the guidelines uh to the text and not uh, coming out in congregation but we, we otherwise we might have seen uh, the similar protest that is happening around the world so we request gctc to take it strongly with our mea with the with the 
with all the uh, foreign policy uh, platforms and uh, as early as in the previous stands that gctc has been taking the voices because this is a time not to find the equal equality between who is right or who is wrong obviously we don't support the instances of violent responses from hamas there is in between the idf and the hamas about more than 250 people have died including 67 children there are names these are not just numbers or names they are real human lives which have been lost and the world should come together to mourn we have seen the fire that came at notre dame in france the whole world international community came together chipping in funds to the uh, funds as well as uh, messages from around the world for for the burning of the uh, notre dame church and here we have people life who have been who have been on the street uh, their bodies have been buried, buried in the debris of those uh, buildings that have been demolished on the pretext of uh, uh, hamas hide out or whatever provocation were there media houses the, the huge buildings of al jazeera or the associate press the us media houses they have been demolished i think like, this is truly not ex uh, acceptable i'm reading the report uh, which says that in last 10 days the uh, the, uh, the numbers of palestinians that have died it is it is uncomparable to last 15 years of resistance from the palestinian side or you call it from the hamas that the number of israelis have died into that retaliation in last 15 years not as much as numbers which has perished in last 10 days at the, in gaza and and those who have been injured in jerusalem so we are not here to favor any a government who's losing their cloud like nathan you government and and we have to make it very clear that when we're talking about uh, when we are talking about upholding justice and we are talking about the righteousness we are not saying that we are particularly against any faith tradition christianity judaism and islam they're all from the abrahamic faith and we are all part of the one family as assisted in the quran hazrat musa alaihi salam moses is as much as the prophet so as much as the prophet to us as the prophet jesus and prophet muhammad so salam these are the spiritual and religious line that we all connect to so we hope and pray that in the coming days india will again uh, collectively with south asian voices of justice assert and uh, clarify this stand that no escalation and no death should be no death of civilians should be acceptable in any sense for whatever provocations come from each side and that is our prayers from ajmer sharif and hopefully all the elders who have shared their remarks would be uh, paid heed and and a uh, proposal from gctc would be tabled upon uh, to be shared where the policies can make a change and difference can come inshallah uh, thank you for giving us this platform i know the time is running out as there are few other speakers but it is important to understand uh, and uh, from the perspective of human perspective we are no uh, no way to justify a falling government use of violence to generate uh, support we'll see what happens in a month's time or two months time to the nitin you government but there is no way that israelis or the palestinians are up against each other it is the government escalations whatever they want to do it should not result in civilian casualty that's the, that should be the always the stand from india salam and lots of duas and blessings to all of you thank you thank you uh, sayed Sal salman chishti now i invite dr uh, nand kishor who is associate uh, uh, professor and head of the department of geopolitics and international relations at the manipal academy of uh, higher education uh, welcome and uh, uh, please uh, make your presentation thank you chair and uh, thanks to all my co panelists uh, for having taken enough time to explain everything uh, so that we are left with very less to speak about but anyway because the per perspective was, uh, that was uh, supposed to be given Uh, was from south asia in terms of what has been our responses uh, from this side uh, to be specific i don't know whether we have left anything for the next panel um, uh, now having said that uh, the very important component is also what has south asian nations have done for uh, or in this last 15 days or 12 days whatever uh, we have done is is also not uh, exactly uh being reflected in terms of what has been the political class doing surprisingly let me make give an example 
the pakistani if you uh, look at the, they have been very very consistent with regard to what they have been and all that but rather than asking for our brokering peace what exactly the state did it was very interesting to look at uh, because when there was in one part of pakistan in the in the border town of chaman uh, which was uh, the program that was hosted by abdul qadir loni there was a blast that happened now, nobody knows who exactly did this when they can blame uh, baloch or they can bail, bail, uh, blame many other people but very interestingly there were two important politicians one um, uh, maulana abdul akbar uh, chitrali uh, of the national assembly uh, surprisingly this person and there was also another woman rather than asking for peace and asking world leaders to come together and as a responsible country from south asia we sympathize with those in the, those warring parties or uh, the deaths that are happening on both the sides whichever way it is they were asking that the only thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead with with jihad we need to go we should allow why are we having uh, what do you say uh nuclear weapons are they are they children's toy articles in our museum now this is the sort of response that was coming which was which was very problematic or which was very disturbing these are law makers these are the people who are influential in the society whom people look up to it's it's not that people don't look up to how much social media can do social media can percolate and more so many times it can do more damage in terms of hate and each other putting up uh, things on no, both the sides somebody is. says i love israel somebody says i love uh, palestine now when these are happening the expectation from the political class is to live up to some standards where they are in a position to tell people that we don't need to do that one we need to look for various other ways to build up the pressure like the way the palestine this thing the the foreign minister of of pakistan did where he happened to be there where we looked at how to um, what is a bring out diplomatic outreach to uh, uh, make sure that there are efforts to mobilize international support for palestine i was also surprised to see that um, that israel is interested in keeping hamas because it it helps its um, survival that's a very surprising say, statement to me because hamas took birth only in 2006 and prior to that when we don't see hamas existing or anything of that if at all somebody has to be blamed for the present condition of palestine it should be arafat it is he who did not allow it to happen when it had gone to a particular scenario where the status of sovereignty could have been a possibility but surprisingly that did not happen now having known this this is uh, this is something that came from uh, uh, pakistan and we 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 have in south asia itself we have four important states that don't even recognize israel that also needs to be understood that means they have already taken position that this is how it is it's fair enough they have they have reasons to do so but at the same time has it been only that much there are no other connections that they are having how has been uh, how have they been responding it's very interesting to look at that even bangladesh has has come out very strongly uh, saying that this is not acceptable and they they've had very good relationship in fact uh, arafat had visited and uh, he had met even uh, mujibur rahman but apart from these things what they have they have expressed is very interesting where they say while well, expressing our deep condolence to the victims and sympathies to our palestinian brothers and sisters we unequivocally uh, denounce such acts of terror and violence and urge the international community to take sustainable measures to end such kinds of acts where anywhere and everywhere in the world including palestine what they are trying to be is much more balanced in fact this is something that is expected though they are not uh, they have not recognized israel but yet they are not speaking in such terminologies where it will fuel further because more and more uh, violence it leads to more and more sort of uh, self determination that language that would come from elsewhere it is very surprising to see that way and um, now sri lanka I, i i found it much more uh, balancing in terms of uh, uh, their their very act itself because they have had their support in 2009 with regard to elimination of ltt and other things they they respect them but at the same time they are very clearly aware that uh, that in invariably mahind rajapaksa was someone who openly said that he is for the uh, he had this pro palestine in this thing and i'm sure all of you are aware that there is also a street named in west bank in his name so uh, there is there is this balanced view that has come from uh, sri lanka as well though the public and and enlightened citizens have been writing about it but nevertheless you see very less this is also very specific to nepal nepal is going through its own turmoil so there has not been great response to what it has been because israel has 
uh, been very very strong uh, presence israel has very strong presence with regard to nepal but sri lanka nepal as well as uh, as well as india's is anyway known it's completely torn apart and, and ambassadors and others have already spoken about it now uh, maldives again it, it has stood by its word and it is also continuing with its 2014 statement of not having or boycotting all the israeli products and other things now very interestingly um, uh, what comes back uh, is 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 interesting to the history bites back in the sense there was a par particular point of time with regard to afghanistan for that matter now i'm just trying to touch all of these countries uh, to just get a feel how south asia as such has responded to this particular problem uh, it, it looks very interesting because during uh, the the soviet occupation when the mujahideens were were coming up and uh, israel was very much uh, hand in glove there it israel uh, had had also trained a lot of instructors. Israel had done quite a few things at that particular point of time. But now things have changed. Things uh, have been turning out in a different way. Now uh, we all actually, or many scholars uh, across the spectrum, had thought it is the United States that can in exert a lot of pressure on them. But at least they understood that it's not just about exerting pressure on Israel, but also it has to be equally on the other side on the Hamas. I think there were. Egypt has become very, very important because they know that Hamas cannot, uh, Hamas knows that it cannot have two front uh, issue because on the one hand, they have to manage uh, Egypt also. So for keeping that in the mind, they have, they have come to this conclusion. But nobody knows this is, this is something that has erupted, whether uh, Hamas is going to be, I, I also happened to see an article where India should, should India recognize Hamas? Should India, uh, what do you say, invite them or anything of that sort? Nobody knows about it. There is a hand in glow. There is Iran, which is supporting, um, uh, what do you say, Hamas. And there is, there is much more complication with regard to this one. And at the same time, uh, whatever, whether we agree or not, Palestine is a broken house. You have the Islamic Jihad, you have Hamas, you also have Abbas, someone who's sitting be there for a very, very long time. Now, who with whom they have to negotiate? Who is exactly the beneficiary of this one? I think uh, as, as people, not directly the stakeholders being there, I think it's very, very difficult for us to assess some of these things. But apart from maybe three countries in, in, uh, in, the, in the South Asian states, I think others have been more observing and they have been asking for restraint. They have been asking for peace. They also know that the world itself is going through a different type of problem altogether. And then this is not the time where these things erupt again and again and it has to come in. I think the peace has to prevail. If that has to prevail, I think both hands have to uh, have to come together. It cannot be one side. If Israel is responding, Israel is responding because it has a reason to do so. If Palestine is responding because Palestine has a reason to do it, thinks Israel is an occupier and it's been happening for from time to time. There were exactly, I took it back to Asir Arafat. Look at the time of his discussion and the occupations that were there. Look at the present day one. I think there was a golden opportunity that was lost. And, and not recognizing and saying that the state of Israel should not exist at all is out of question. That is, that is going to be a dream and nobody can achieve ever. This has been happening from some of the extremist elements who are saying, we'll see to it, we'll see the day where they will also go that way. We are, we are pretty sure about it. Let them plant trees and take refuge in that one. And that's what has been written in the prophecy. And that's going to be the way. Probably that's not the way we have to deal with. So South Asia, except for few states who have been extreme in their responses, others have been nuanced. All of them are, have been asking for peace, which itself is a very, very positive notion for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lankisho. That was a very... Uh succinct uh, presentation about uh, all regions, which which is what this uh, session is really about. Uh, thank you for sort of rounding it up uh, very nicely. I uh, I will open the uh, thing to the discussion. To let me start with the first question. Um, there is a role for India in this uh, to bring. Uh, to, to bring about some diplomatic resolution um, in the current situation. And I, I'm just a little surprised because India is uh, facing such a setback uh, globally, uh, internationally, for the way it has handled its own pandemic. Its stature is so diminished now. Uh, who, uh, what, what role can India actually play? And um, how, how can, uh, how 
to the people who think that it can play this role? How do they for, uh, how do they envisage this? Uh, maybe uh, uh, somebody can uh, clarify this. Yes, okay, that's a very good question, Nirupamaji. You know, but I think there is uh, one needs to delink our handling of the pandemic. The I don't. That's a different issue altogether. See, India. Why I'm saying at this point of time is political leadership is very strong. Otherwise, 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 in the investment for a set aside pandemic handling. Point here is, the India is well placed. It's a very good relations with Israel, Hamas, and for the, all the actors. They are the key actors. Saudi, I told you, UAE, because I'm not very clear whether Saudi and UAE are playing some back channel role with our. Um, you know, conflict with Pakistan, that I'm not very sure because I'm not an expert in South Asia, that is also there. And uh, and USA, see, USA, Joe Biden is a little different from Trump in the sense, obviously, is Trump was blatantly into Palestine, <coughs> which Joe Biden has made a course correction. Now, everyone believes in two-state solution. Two-state solution, this is where I, what I've been advocating is not a high profile, media glaze public role very low profile behind the scene proactive role feeling sending feelers talking to people and bring them together because this is where you can if, if israel if you are we have got very strong ties with israel strong can we convince israel that the and on our interest lies in stability in the region and stability in the region will not be ensured as long as there is resolution in the palestine issue palestinians they are not asking much no, and so therefore, India it, it it's 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 in exploratory stage. This is these are my ideas, my, and my understanding has been that the so-called policy of uh, you know uh, dehyphenation. I mean, this is a wrong term in my opinion. What is dehyphenation? How can you dealing when they are close linked? You can't Israel unless they are close linked. You can't dehyphenate. You have a different but It's very good that you have had standing relations with both parties, and you are a um, um, little, um, you are very little, um, uh, you know, uh, doubtful about the Palestinians. In my own interaction, I've been to Palestine. Palestinians do look forward. Why? Because now again, if in an interesting lesson, the peacemakers, you have the ability, you have the resources, and the willingness. All three you have. You have resources. You have the ability. Are you willing to do it? That's a big, and you will be acceptable. And this is not to sidetrack the Americans. This is not to bypass Americans. This is sort of multilateral approach. Because where you can see in Russia also. Russia has very good relations with all the parties in the conflict. It's a very good policy. So this is a, this is an, it's an academic and exploratory stage. It's up to the uh, practicing diplomats how practical it is. And it's no, no harm in trying that. That's where I'll stop here. Anybody else wants to weigh in on this question before I move to the next? Man, I, would like to, I, would, I would like to comment also, if it's possible. Yeah, please. So uh, first, uh, I would like to say that uh, I, I feel uh, about India like it's my uh, second home. I was the project manager for uh, the Barak system for a generation. And I uh, worked a lot with the DRDO and the Indian Navy and with uh, the last years with the National Maritime Foundation in India. So I feel uh, about India like it's my second home. And nevertheless, I can say that uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the last uh, things that happened and the way that the Indian government uh, reacted uh, uh, through the Palestinians uh, for me was a very big uh, surprise uh, because uh, first India, uh, Israel stand uh, behind India for in the last uh, 40, 50 years supplying weapons, technologies, and even uh, in the last pandemic, uh, supporting India in vaccines uh, without any questions, uh, just as a true friend. And with that, uh, uh, India, the Indian uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs just announced in the UN how much uh, India supports the Palestinian issue. And I think that the, the perspective about that is very wrong, because when Palestinians are speaking about occupation, this is not uh, correct, because the Gaza Strip there is no even one Israeli, single Israeli over there. The Gaza Strip is being ruled by two terrorist organizations that are being many, but are being uh, sponsored, trained, and uh, everything by Iran. Iran is the the real big issue in in the region. 
she is provoking us by by the Hamas and uh, everything concerning that. So it's not really about occupation. They are, have their own their sovereignty. They have their own rule, their own country, their own government. They don't do anything uh, relating to Israel. They have their own land. This is nothing about occupation. And more than that, all the water, medicine, uh, fuel, everything is being given from Israel to the Palestinian, even though the, those the days in the last uh, uh, 15, 14 days that they were uh, firing more than 4,000 bombs to our cities, everything uh, was com continuing uh, being supported by Israel to this, uh, uh, those uh, guys because we are fighting the uh, Hamas terror and the organization and we are not fighting against the Palestinian guys. And thank you for your input. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Vail, Vail Abad. Uh, it's actually flowing also. The, it's a nice uh, flow from Dr. Eyal's uh, surprise at the Indian stand. And this is from Shubham Monga and he wants to do, ask Dr. Awad, did Modi support Palestine despite his followers being pro-Israel, in order to avoid global condemnation of India for the Kashmir occupation? They use the word occupation. Well, I think, I think in Rupama here is the issue is not whether Mr. Modi is there or whether it is Rajiv Gandhi or whether it's Sandira Gandhi or it is Mahatma Gandhi. The issue of India stand very strong, consistently have been supporting justice and justice and adhering to UN Charter and UN Security Council resolution. India understood the cause of the Palestinian ever since the post Second World War and most of the country taking independence and India took a, took a strong lead in the movement of the freedom of every nation, including the apartheid in South Africa, where they have been supported by most of the countries till the apartheid politically have been removed. So I don't see any change of India position. Maybe some people, Indian foreign policy, they are more pro because I don't see on those terms at all because if India have the only, the first non-Arab country to recognize Palestine as a state, I think that will continue. And India is maybe waiting for the restructuring of the UN because if India has to play its major role as a global uh, emerging power, I'm sure they will have the chances of putting on the table the actual injustice should be amended and should be giving both sides. India is always for two-state solution, and that's my final answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> uh, the <clears throat> next question is for uh, Ambassador uh, Bhattacharya. Um, uh, this is from Shiv Bhagwan Saharan. How do you see uh, the way forward uh, for a resolution of this conflict? Uh, already there have been many uh, diplomatic uh, efforts and uh, which have not worked and um, so and all these have failed uh, so what is the way out yeah okay now we all we all talk about the two state solution but i think we should also now talk about the one state solution which has been talked about a lot and the one state solution is that we have a composite state uh, which includes Israelis and Arabs. I mean, uh, that a, a fact which, by the way, let me again go back to a certain thing. I don't know how many of you know that, that Albert Einstein and Nehru uh, wrote to each other on this issue. Though, though Albert Einstein was also, a, he was not a Zionist, but he was a supporter of the Jewish state. But he was also a supporter of the composite state. And that is one of the reasons why he never accepted to be the president of Israel when Ben-Gurion invited him. So anyway, that's, that's history. But what I'm trying to say is that a single state, is it possible? I mean, uh, there are people who are talking about it with equal rights for everybody. And, uh, but then the questions will arise of, uh, what about the refugees? Can they come back? The right to return, et cetera, and all those things. If the Israelis have a right to return under their system of Ali, then should the Palestinians have the right of return? Provided there is a single unitary state in uh, in uh, in Palestine. Now, if we talk about the two-state solution, how do we go back to 1948? That is the issue. And in any case, the 98 partition plans was not accepted by the Palestinians. They never accepted it, and that is what led to the war. And that is how they lost out, in my view. If they had accepted it, they would have been today 
in a far greater and stronger position uh, which israel is today basically exercising its power over them so i think these are some of the issues we need to discuss but i don't think the two state solution in the form that it was conceived is today possible the palestinians will probably ha have to accept a state minus a two state their state minus certain things that could be perhaps some land perhaps some you know you know some sovereignty issues etc because i don't see israel i don't see israel giving up the security cover that they have let's say along the along the river jordan and or all say in the north you know in near the golan heights because you see they they you have to understand their mentality also as to how they look at these things so i think a two state solution is possible under the current real uh, realistic situation provided concessions are made by both sides but i don't think a 1948 two state solution is possible okay thank thank you uh, thank you ambassador uh, that is a uh, you've given uh, some insight into this whole question Yeah, there's a question for General Lodi saying that uh, isn't uh, pa Pakistan sort of uh, uh, undermining its own uh, support for the uh, Palestinian cause uh, by uh, some of its uh, some of the members of its National Assembly advocating the use of nuclear uh, weapons against Israel? Uh, isn't that uh, something to be concerned about? Uh, thank you very much. i think if i just say one sentence that it is absurdity uh, the way they were talking and as uh, many of my colleagues uh, here also reflected on that i agree with them those who understand nuclear weapons uh, those who understand nuclear strategy they would laugh at uh, you know uh, such assertions uh, that, that what are these weapons for and all that but you can always forgive you know whether it is uh, it are your M mp's or our mp's uh, one odd would say something which is so weird so i would not go along with them and i will agree with uh, most of the panelists over here that that was not the right uh, thing to say okay uh, there's a question for uh, dr pradhan why did uh, saudi arabia and other members of the gcc uh, keep mum over the recent escalation why did they remain passive at least they could have shown non part is an approach for immediate deescalation yeah. see this is a much more complex question you must understand people should understand make a clear distinction between arab israel conflict and israel palestine conflict don't conflate these two in this way israel ever since 1960 78 came david israel has been able to lure arab states conventional arab states to to peace with israel that's a different that, that's a different track also we we they were able to and overall The, if you talk about there is always a difference between the Arab street and the seat of power. The seat of power when the monarchy legend they in a way have forgotten the Palestine cause. Let us be very, very clear about that. But the Arab street is resonating with the Palestinians. So it's a pan-Arab cause. The street, therefore, sometimes they have to make some noise here and there. Saudi Arabia recently has come out in this in this during this crisis. Saudi Arabia has come out asking for a stay and stop it. So there has come out, but here this is this is this is the problem where you know uh, the Arabs have uh, in, in fact the non-Arab countries are more vocal in championing the Palestinian cause than the Arab countries, but that doesn't discount that the Arab sentiments to Palestinian cause. That is, it's a Palestinian, it's a broader cause. So therefore, Saudi Arabia has they have their own compulsions, and the next state who is going to establish diplomatic relations, if I'm right, or the back channel diplomacy, it's Saudi Arabia. So that is that is that's much more more complex, you know. So these so in the conventional Arab regimes will not do much except making noises and statements. Right. There's a question, another question for you from uh, Shiv Bhagwan Saharan, who asks, can we consider the lack of democracy in West Asia as one of the triggers behind this conflict? Okay, this is it's my story. Anyway. And democracy is a, again a large issue. Democracy uh, now it has become very contestable. I mean, uh, I mean, <clears throat> democracy cannot be. I mean, lack of democracy. When you talk about Israel Palestine, don't you think Palestinians have democracy? The whole problem started with that. When Hamas won elections, why did the world not recognize that? Is it not democracy? 
The Western standards of democracy are problematic. Western set of democracy is that when you, this is when again <coughs> some of the panelists talked about the elections, the division. Elections will be held. And my my own reading of the ground realities is Fatah will be totally marginalized. Hamas may come out. Again, the world will not recognize that. What sort of democracy are talking about? Democracy is not, it's basically simple, you don't bring that issue. Occupation versus resistance. The peace people's basic right to national self-determination. And uh, again, uh, uh, if I may add in here, the Palestinians are not demanding along the 1948 border. Palestinians are demanding 1967 border. 22% West Bank and Gaza with these years, that's all. Yeah, I, I have another question. You know, I wanted to understand the statement that was made in the United Nations Security Council by our uh, permanent representative. Uh, would you say that it was a, uh, would you say that it was a more pro-Palestinian statement? Uh, uh, and if so, I mean, would you like to parse it for the audience and for uh, for me that statement because it had many elements. It had it uh, it located uh, the conflict. I mean, it located the trigger for this whole conflict in East Jerusalem, which seemed to be pro-Palestinian. It seemed to be telling Israel that it should not disturb the status quo, which seemed to be anti-Israel. So was it a balanced statement, do you think, or was it more a pro-Palestinian statement? Well, I would, uh, I would say it was very well crafted a statement and taking into account uh, the current realities and India's own national interest and perception. We have stood for the Palestinian cause forever. There has been no wavering in that. There are uh, sometimes you will uh, say some of the people who are opposing it or, or criticizing it say that you're not talking about the 1967 boundaries or whatever it is. But at the same time, if you come to think of it, what did this statement talk about? It talked about number one, uh, not only this statement, I mean, we are in the UN Security Council at the moment. And India has been working very closely with all the partners to come up with a statement, uh, which could not come, come out because of the, uh, the, the Americans. But in this particular case, what India's statement was very clear. I mean, we condemn the violence that was there, disproportionate, indiscriminate uh, use of force. That is not uh, there. The civil strife that has occurred, that India has very openly criticized. It has asked for the status quo which means that there should not be encroachments, evictions, and all that. That's very clear. We have also very specifically talked about the status of Jerusalem, which is also very dear to us. Yeah. Many people might not know, but in the First World War, it was a lot of Indian soldiers who had defended Jerusalem. And we have a long history with the city, per se, as it is. A lot of, I mean, India's nearly 20, 25%, 30% population, uh, whether Christians and Muslims, hold it very dear. We, have, we are asking exactly what is required to be done at this stage. So it, if somebody were to follow it, I think it is a very clear, strong platform to start the talks. That's what we are saying, direct talks between the two sides. And for that, there have to be conditions. The rigid uh, positions will have to be abdicated by both the sides. As I said earlier, that Israel will have to stop thinking of Hamas as merely a terrorist organization and Hamas will have to acknowledge Israel's right to exist. So the very basic fundamental things are issue. Ambassador Chakravarti spoke about single one state solution. That is, in my view, again, very unlikely. Likewise, the third state solution, which also Dr. Vaila Bhaz, since I was ambassador to Jordan, that it could become a confederate with Jordan. That is also Jordanians don't want it. Because their own population is about 60% Palestinians. It causes the problem and destabilization within their own state. And this is the Jordanian king who is the custodian of the Holy Mosque and the Christian sites in the city of Jerusalem. So it is complicated. But it requires, I think, the, uh, the Americans, if they come on board, and they are the only ones today. Uh, somebody is talking about India playing great role. I'm, I'm all for it. And I say that we could have perhaps been a little more proactive. Uh, at this time, because this was an opportunity for India to play a role, because for the simple reason, when Prime Minister Modi went there, and what we call dehyphenation is that every time earlier, whenever whatever visits took place, they took place to both Israel and Palestine to please the two sides. That was serving no purpose, frankly. We need to deal with each country on its own merits. So that's what precisely we did. So when Prime Minister Modi went to Israel first, 
and he followed before that but you will realize that we invited president abbas to india he was briefed properly so every time we have kept them in the loop so we at no point have we tried to short change the palestinian cause i think that this was an extremely well crafted well balanced statement and people can always find fault with the wordings here or wordings there uh, but that does not decide the foreign policy just had one question for jen lodi um which is you know uh, you didn't really talk about the pressures on pakistan to reopen ties with uh, to to establish ties with israel is that still a current uh, um you know question or uh, uh, is it now uh, in the past i mean is are people still talking about that well uh, thank you very much uh, you know uh, the there's a pressure uh, from two sides the external pressure and the internal pressure and they are opposite in direction there could be certain external uh, actors wanting us to uh, uh, you know uh, ask us to uh, get israel uh, but uh, from our internal politics it is not possible for the time being and uh, the margin is too large i mean there's a very thin elite those who would like uh, us to recognize the rail and is a very big mass of people those who would not like our government to do that so i think uh, if we weigh the two uh, government will have to listen to the majority of uh, their own people and that is what they are doing and we have that uh, you know staff that uh, the, the two uh, country solution as long as that is not implemented uh, pakistan cannot recognize the rail and i think uh, uh, that is a good uh, uh, hedging for us and we are continuing with that So where does the Pakistan army lie on this question? Pakistan army and Pakistan government uh, uh, today, I mean, uh, they think alike, and uh, uh, they have the same understanding, same feeling as I was saying. Maybe a thin elite within the army may also be thinking uh, as the other elite is thinking, but majority of the soldiers and the army at large, they would not like uh, Israel to be recognized. Okay. thank you uh, thank you so much everybody um thank you all the speakers for being part of this thank you aditya uh, gctc shivani for organizing this uh, very uh, uh, fascinating session a lot of uh, um, a lot of thoughts shared ideas shared and i have uh, come away uh, richer for uh, being part of this uh, thank you so much thank you all thanks a lot to all panelists and our moderator to sum up uh, this discussion touched upon various aspects including the changing relationship of india with palestine uh, domestic politics of israel and palestine the impact of this ongoing situation on the future potential for terrorism which was a very interesting point that was raised uh, some very noteworthy lessons were also touched upon most memorably the fact that atrocities and human rights violations cannot buy peace as shared by general lodi Uh, the complexity of the south asian position was also discussed as well as the fact that there is no complexity as far as extremism is concerned as remarked by ambassador trigunai we also took a look at the problems with palestinian representation israel's motivation for palestinian occupation and india's reaction to the latest standoffs both on social media and in the unsc we also discussed the reaction of south asia as a whole to the situation as it unfolds um thanks again to the entire, well, entire planum panel for very interesting and important insights as well as some very significant spirited arguments uh, before we take a short break uh, we would like to share a video message from mr suresh prabhu india sherpa to the g7 and g20 and uh, former minister so let me congratulate my friend aditya tikku and this gctc for organizing this important event on the present emerging humanitarian military socio economic crisis not far away from india but normally the world has so many problems that when it is not so near to you net next door to you you don't want to think about a far away problems so the challenge what's happening in gaza is something which many people might think it is nothing to with me is far away i should worry about it but for india it's very close to the heart india shares very good relationship with the parties to this conflict they have deep understanding about the problem india has always 
work with Palestinians and lately with Israelis on many important issues. And therefore, it's not a problem far away for India. It's closer to us, closer to our hearts. And therefore, we are extremely worried and also feel sympathies for these innocent people, the civilians who are dying on either side as a result of this conflict. There have been air raids, there have been rockets which are flying from the skies, but hitting the ground and not hitting the ground in a no man's territory. It is hitting where there are a large number of people living. Children are died, women are passed away, media houses have been destroyed. One Indian lady working in Israel has also died and she has nothing to do with the conflict, but she just died. And she could be a symbol of how innocent people are dying. And therefore, this is very important that India strongly feels that we must stop this conflict as early as possible. There should be a ceasefire and that should be the immediate action that should be taken by both the parties. The United Nations should act swiftly. The Security Council has not been able to arrive at a proper resolution of this. But I think we must take lead as a global community and we should stop it immediately. I was, I was welcoming the comment made by President Biden when he said the hostilities must stop immediately. I hope his words will carry weight and they'll be able to take immediate action to work on this. So while we do this, that's immediate, that must happen. But also, we must ensure that what triggered it should also be stopped. The forcible eviction which led to some problems also must be properly taken care of. We must ensure that the rights of citizens to worship, citizens to follow their own standards also must be honored. We also feel, and India is strongly believer in that, that we must have two nation state idea. That's the best way to do it. They should be able to peacefully coexist with each other. The Palestinians, the Israelis, Israel is a state that we recognize by us. And therefore we feel that we must allow the people to live in harmony with each other, respect each other's rights, respect each other's responsibilities. And by doing that, you can bring in long, enduring peace to the region. The Palestinian problem, the problems in Gaza, always snowballs into a much larger problem in the Middle East, which creates a global problem eventually. Even at this particular time, as we are, the fighting is on, there have been so many demonstrations happening within Israel itself. They're happening in other parts of the world. So we feel that we should try to resolve it in a way that will bring enduring peace to the region, to the people, and that can make sure that people can live in peace. So each Jerusalem and the neighborhood also must be properly taken care of because that's where the problems really started. In fact, the Indian hospice, which is a historic place associated with a great Indian Sufi saint Baba Farid and located inside the old city is also a place that we consider very important to us. So for India, it is very important that we work in such a way that we bring enduring peace to the region, peace to the people. And as we always say that we reiterate India's strong support to the just Palestinian cause and unwavering commitment to the two state solution. In fact, I'm very happy that our permanent representative of India in the United Nations made this statement on the United Nations Security Council retaking India's stand. I think we must work and we must work in a way that our friend Israel and Palestine, they will be living in peace and harmony for a long, long time to come. Let God give strength to both the parties. Let the wisdom dawn on all of them and let the peace return. Thank you.